Hey, Tommy from the Runcesters, and welcome to another one of our big video guides. In this one, we are talking about super trainers. So super trainers in what we're talking about is those trainers that have a lot of tech that you find in carbon plate super shoes. So plates, special foams, that sort of thing. We're going to be talking about what exactly super trainers are, why you might need them and what the future has in store for them. This video is also part of the podcast. So if you're planning on listening to the podcast, maybe don't watch this video. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Seiski. Now, if you're listening to this or watching this, you probably already know about Seiski, but if you don't, it's a brand that comes from Copenhagen and it designs really nice looking kit. So throughout the year, you'll get loads of different colorways, loads of different seasonal designs. And if you're into really fashionable looking running kit, Seiski is probably a good bet for you. The interesting thing about Seiski is that it's not just about looks though, because a lot of their kit is really well designed for performance. And Seiski have a focus on something they call everyday heroes, and that is athletes, sub-athletes, anyone really that wants to really get some great looking running kit that is designed for tackling stuff like sweat, the heat, all those things that you need when you're looking for performance in your running kit. The brand was set up in 2013 by Lars Peterson, the CEO, who was actually a pro windsurfer who wanted to take the ideas of the chilled out vibes that you get in uh, those sorts of sports and bring it into the world of running to make it a little bit more accessible and enjoyable for people to buy running kit. Zayski has also given us a discount for all of our listeners and readers. So if you want to get 15% off at the online store, you can use the code TRT15 and get yourself some nice kit. Hey guys, so super trainer is a term that is, uh, to be honest, I, I've never heard it before. This is this is <laughs> this is what you call them, Nick. But they're, what, they're essentially sh- versatile shoes with a lot of fancy tech in them. Yeah, basically, I think they're shoes that started as training partner shoes. Like the first batch of them were things like the Endorphin Speed Three. They were designed to be used as your training partner to a full carbon shoe, and they basically brought elements of the tech in carbon super shoes to training shoes. So super foams, you know, you know the lightest, bounciest foams that the brands have. Plates in particular, obviously rods with Adidas, and that's how I think of them. Super trainers are basically shoes you use for training that have elements of super shoe technology in them it's getting harder to specify them though because early on it was they were fast shoes and now actually people are really going down the more the all-rounder route with them and actually almost designing these trainers to use for easy runs more than anything else and it's getting a bit nebulous like do you even have to have a plate in them like the asics super blast i kind of consider a super trainer but it doesn't have a plate in it but it does have asics's best foam and then there's things like the hoka bondi x which i don't know what that shoe is for but i guess it's kind of a super trainer in a sense um mm. So it's getting more nebulous, but yeah, the overall the overarching concept here is you're getting shoes from basically brands who had these very expensive shoes that were quite a niche item. I think they thought this technology will apply really well to trainers and we'll sell a lot more of them as well. So now we've got these super trainers or I guess plated trainers is another word if you are excluding stuff without plates, but or as you call them, daily super shoes, Tom. Daily super uh, shoes, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they're, they're now a massive area on the market and some of, I think, the best shoes available are in this area. Hmm. It's a trick. It's interesting you bring up things like the Bondi X. I think there there is yeah. an element of this where just putting in some technology in a shoe is very marketable these days. Just saying, oh, yeah. we put a plate in it. Hawk could keep doing it by putting X on the end of shoes and sticking a plate in. Doesn't necessarily always work or need to be done. No. So, Kieran, what what are they designed to do? These super trainers. Yes. <clears throat> yes. I think Nick's covered off a few of the points. You know, they start out, some of them were being kind of partners to the marathon kind of racing shoes. And I guess when those initial uh, plated shoes, super shoes came out for racing, a lot of them weren't particularly durable. So I think these kind of started to fill a gap where you had a shoe that was could handle more kind of daily mileage than some of those other shoes. Although now those sort of top end shoes actually go for longer as well. I think we sort of saw a lot of people were basically spending quite a lot of money buying what we would consider ratios and actually using them for training as well so i guess the big thing overall is these are designed to improve efficiency and and running economy right we're looking at getting efficiency gains so that you can do all of your training all your racing and you can end it with your legs 
less beaten up so that you can train again and get more out of your training. That's essentially what they're designed to do. And I think, you know, initially you sort of think about these being shoes that you're using for your sort of top end sort of training sessions. So your faster runs, your faster sessions, but actually I, I think they've broadened out and I, Overall, you know, I, I'm quite happy to run in a plated daily trainer across a whole range of my runs, everything from really kind of slow and easy and long up to short and fast as well. And they, so they're starting to fill, I think, a, a far bigger sort of remit. And I, I even think, and some people will drop down when I sort of say this, they might not agree, but I, I, you can race in a lot of these shoes now, I would argue. You know, if we, we're talking about margins, but there are many shoes on the market I think lots of people could take and run a marathon in as well as doing mm. all their training. To me, they kind of start to fit this, you know, role of a shoe that can do almost everything and give you added efficiency. Yeah, I agree with that. I almost think that the popularity and the performance of these maybe even took brands by surprise because I, it also was like everyone when when you pull on a carbon shoe for the first time, like when you, the original Vaporflight, it also just feels amazing. You are very fast, but also feels amazing. So the idea is, or oh, they want to sell that feeling every day. Get to you get that feeling every day and actually like you say they end up being shoes that you do use kind of for everything as a result because they are you can just use them for everything <laughs> and and then they've now probably started to try and make them more niche again having initially gone for that all-rounder appeal and now they're probably keener to have them in a box so there's more of a rotation and, and I, I mean i guess i guess for me the obvious sort of example which i'll bang on any given opportunity is is the danube you know a lot of people said to me what well, you're going to run the danube in the speed three which is obviously a plated one of the early sort of plated shoes and it just worked perfectly for that. And it worked across all kind of paces that I was running. And it was it did the right kind of job. And I think, yeah, that, that's where for me the sort of versatility kicks in as an example of this doesn't necessarily have to be just used for when you're doing your all-out intervals. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, there, I, I think there's a, it's difficult with these shoes because with carbon plate shoes, with carbon plate race shoes, you know, you know what the desired use for those shoes is straight away. The, no, nobody's nobody's designing carbon plate super shoes to run slowly in, but these new daily ones it's a bit harder and as a as a consumer it's quite difficult to pick up these shoes because i think most people would still look at these shoes and go oh that's a fast training shoe but it's it's not really the case now because i would you, you'd probably class shoes like you'd even go as far to say like the uh, uh invincible is in some ways one of these super trainers because it it's got a lot of it's got the highest end technology that that Nike's got and a lot of it in there and it's very specifically designed to do something um that goes beyond what you'd find in most running shoes yeah it's difficult here they are really hard to classify to me I think they've got to be able to go fast at times yeah. to really hit the box for me but there are some that are coming out that are just purely even ones with plates in that are designed much more for easier and I guess they are designed part of it is that they are more approachable more accessible to people than carbon shoes not only because of price but yeah. they're more stable they are more durable they're better suited to uh, slower paces probably for some people so there is a lot of that going as well it's almost democratizing it but um we'll come on to talking about you know whether that, that they still have value as as those kind of shoes because some of them i think democratize it so much they don't really end up much different to just a normal old-fashioned cushion shoe mm. which would probably cost you half the price all right well let, let's 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 talk about the um going up against traditional trainers how, what, what how, how do they differ really it's like i was talking about at the top they, they've got just some of those that that tech from the top shoes in there so traditional generally brands would have a different racing shoe to the rest of their lineup i mean in the old days it probably actually wasn't that much different it was just a, a lot less foam and stripped back but you know when the vaporfly came out that was all the stuff in that was confined to the vaporfly the plate the zoom x foam then the plate went to the zoom fly they started to introduce zoom fo zoom x foam to other shoes and that's really what how they differ i guess from in the past, you'd have a trainer which would be built for to be comfortable, you know, durable, relaxing. But now people are happy to spend a bit more and get a shoe that has the foam and the plates and the rods and the you know geometry and speed roll geometry in the case of Saucony, things like that. That ha has that stuff that's come directly from the carbon racing shoes and is now being brought to training shoes. And here's, I play devil's advocate here with you. Um, yeah. If you take something like the Hocker Mac Five. Fantastic shoe for very versatile shoe. You can do a lot of stuff with it. Would you? There, are, there are various of these super trainers out there. I would still pick the Hocker Mac Five over many of these super trainers. Is that? Does that suggest that there's still a, a there's, there's there's not a massive difference between what you're going to get from from having some of this technology in it? 
Yeah, definitely. I think uh, it's. Uh, I think almost this was the year I thought Super Trainers were going to go interstellar and become everywhere. But I think almost they might be in danger of jumping the shark because I do think it actually some of the early ones that were absolutely amazing, like the Endorphins B3, we all loved. I thought that was what they were all going to be like, and that isn't the case at all. And actually, when you look at you know, more simple shoes, a lot of them do really good jobs. And I, yeah, I, yeah, certainly would agree with you, Tom. I don't think they're necessarily outperforming trainers as a rule. It really depends on the individual shoes, and they're definitely more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other big difference. Yeah, they're like twice the price. <laughs> no, they're at least, yeah, they're a fair bit pricey. The, 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 other, the, other, the other thing that I look at as well is when you think about the, them in comparison to, I guess, the super sort of race shoes, is that they're shoes that when you look at them, you do feel a little bit more like, well, actually, every day I'd want to put this on, where there's plenty of the carbon race shoes where you think, I can, I'll wear this for the three hours or whatever I'm going to try and smash this marathon out in. And I'm, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll basically, that's okay, but I don't want to be putting that on every day. And I think they sort of bridge the gap with that. So you look at it. You know, even around the heel collars and the tongues and everything's a little bit more kind of plush and approachable. And then then I think the Mac X is a great example of where maybe that doesn't quite do that. When you look at the Mac 5, is a much more is a shoe you look at much more readily and sort of think I'd for every day I want to wear that over and above the, the Mac X, which to me is a bit kind of stripped back as well. So yeah, it's all for me again, it's getting a bit kind of muddied where that that, that sort of daily comfort for daily sessions, it's not necessarily happening with all of those shoes either. Yeah, and I'd also a lot of the carbon shoes now are better for you can actually just pull them on. A lot of them, if they haven't got too aggressive an upper or too you know limited an outsole, there are certainly some of those that you could pull on every day. And I think a lot of people are doing that, and that's probably one of the reasons again they introduced these super trainers. But I do think it definitely that is definitely that approachability certainly because even with some of them that like, I really like, like the Boston and the Magic Speed Three, they almost feel too racy, like an upper and a fit for a trainer for me and that's something that does differentiate them from the racing shoes a lot, but they should try and make them a bit more approachable. Mm. Well, I, I've just, I, I'm doing a lot of intervals and fartleks and stuff at the moment. And I still, even though I've got lots of these super trainers, I generally will go, if I've got a hard session, I will still go for a calm plate ratio. And when I go out, if I'm just going out for an easy run, an hour long, easy run, hour and a half, easy run, I, I th- that's when I'll pick these shoes up. So I'm not. I don't, I don't know if I'm using them to the extent that the, the technology suggests I should use them. Um, because I, I, what I look for in these, if you look at the Mac X and things like that, is I want to go out. I want to have a nice fun run. Probably not going to run that fast. Might run a little bit faster, but not much more than that. And I, I think that probably doesn't justify the cost and the technology that's in it. But well, I think there is a bit of a problem with real world, real world usage with these shoes. Is that a lot of people now have a couple of old pairs of carbon shoes kicking around that are still great for training sessions and or have a pair of carbon shoes like they, they are using for their biggest sessions just to really get that massive boost but yeah if, if i was designing a rotation from scratch yeah I'd, I'd probably pop a super trainer in it but if i was picking from the shoes i have available i'd go okay well my uh my vaporfly twos will be my workout shoe now and my vaporfly threes are racing kind of thing that that i think that is one area where they do struggle especially with pricing because older carbon shoes are quite cheap well, not cheap, but cheaper than they are yeah. on the RRP. We talked a bit about the uh, sort of traditional trainers now, so let's delve a bit more into what the difference is between the the real carbon plate super shoes and these new super trainers. Yeah, they tend to be a little bit heavier. I think you know the, the uppers tend to be a little less racy. Generally speaking, that's the way they've been going. I think you tend to get a little bit more cushioned, a little bit more comfort overall and they're designed for longer miles uh over sort of day to day to day rather than sort of single stints but um yeah and i i find they're yeah a little bit more cushioned a little bit more protective overall so they're they've got that sort of added versatility you like you said tom for a lot of these you can be very happy running at very sort of easy paces in them as well as sort of ticking up to fast where for me the the best carbon race shoes are the shoes that probably perform only when I'm running at my best in a way, if you know what I mean. It's like there are some shoes. This is why I'm a big fan of the old vapor flies. It's like you, you really only had one way to run in them. So when you wanted to go fast in mm. them, you had to be on it. And then when you were, they worked really well. But then I've then dismissed a whole swathe of shoes that have got brilliant versatility for race shoes as well. And that's a bonus. But yeah. Uh, I always think, as, I think 
there is a, certainly an element of difference in geometry as well. And it's something that's not always easily apparent or very easy to explain sometimes with shoes. But I think a really good example of this is the new New Balance SC Trainer V2, which has a fuel cell, mid-cell foam, uh, carbon plate, uh, you know, and a rocker design. It's all of which is exactly the same as the SC Elite V3. The SC Trainer is a lot heavier. They've probably got a slightly different formulation of fuel cell. But I think it's almost the geometry that makes a big difference there. And it's just night and day. The SC Trainer, the SC Elite, the racing shoe, feels very fast, really aggressive, pushes you onto your toes, really going for it. Similar stack height, same foam, same energy arc rocker in theory on the uh, training shoe, but it feels really much slower in transition, much more geared for sitting back and running slowly. And that's quite you know a difficult thing to do for brands. And I think some of them don't do it. Some of them make them very similar, like the Endorphin Speed and Pro uh, often have quite similar geometries, although it varies with the various stack heights. But I think that New Balance one really explains sometimes how the trainers have been geared to handle that easy running just by making it a slower feeling shoe uh, in the more comfortable way. All right, let's uh, let's talk about the big the big question, the big point that is probably a, a bit <laughs> of a sticking point for most people, the price. Now the price this this is the major thing that's that's if if, if you if you're shopping sh- for shoes, you can pretty much instantly tell from the price tag if it's a, a super trainer nowadays. And that with, mm. with quite a lot of them coming in almost at the same price as some or most of the uh, calm plate shoes at the moment. Um, mm. Why are they so expensive? <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just they've got that that super shoe sheen to them. Actually, originally they weren't that expensive because they were billed as training partner shoes. I think still the best uh, of these super trainers, things like the Endorphin Speed, the Adidas Boston 12, the Magic Speed, are priced a level below super shoes mm. uh, according to their status. But now it feels like once you've got a high enough stack and have got some kind of foam or plate in there, you can do what you want with the pricing, but it, they are outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems to me that the, um, the, the, the price, the, the price of the shoes is actually, I mean, we're, we live in, we live in a world where everything's getting more expensive far beyond probably what it needs to be. But if you look back at some of the things like the Hocker Rocket X, that was a very affordable shoe. Um, nowadays I can't see it being that cheap. I think that would have, they've whacked up the price quite a lot. That was a bit before it's time. I think before the, before the big super trainer um, yeah. uh, boom. So I, I definitely, I'd definitely, I'd be surprised. I think it was 100 and, 130, 140. 100, yeah. And it was, it was billed as more as a racing shoe, really. Yeah. As, as, um, and then uh, I, it feels like they, they're, they're, uh, some maybe they're being viewed a little bit as a license to print money because it's yeah. selling carbon and stuff technology to a wider audience than traditional super shoes which probably are you know they don't feel niche to us because we spend so much time talking about them and see do races and see people using them but they are still a relatively niche product and I'm I, sure. I guess the super shoes yeah. have raised the ceiling right the super shoes have given a bit, little bit of wiggle room they've yeah. made a, a nice little area in the middle where these shoes can neatly slot in <laughs> at, yeah so i mean the yeah. carbon i that's what it's- the hoka carbon x i think was only I think that was like 150, 130, 150 when that launched. Yeah. And even now, if you look back at that original one, you might say, well, is that just a, is that really just a sort of a super daily trainer? <laughs> or was it a race? You know, there's like, now if you look back at them, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. And that, I, I think brands are definitely feeling their way around this area a lot. I still remember talking to people two years after Vaporfly came out and they're going, oh, it's a niche, it's a niche thing. It's not a thing. This, this isn't going to be popular. And then, racing to catch up and they realized that everyone was buying these shoes and i think now they're worried to get they don't want to get caught out on super trainers potentially and it's people are coming in pretty pretty aggressive with their pricing it's, strategy it's a va- i find it a vague area though like racing shoes car and plate race shoes if you buy a racing shoe for 280 pounds and it makes you slightly faster you can equate the value of that to the money that's what people are, are paying for isn't it yeah. they're not going to get a ratio that makes them slower but, but with these daily shoes there's no actual quantifiable value to to, to the uh, additional price which i think is going to be the tricky bit because what you know most people are just going oh yeah i, was, I, had, I had a few all right runs it cost me 220 quid it's um it's a difficult proposition for i was going to say that's a really interesting point because if you think about you know the original super shoes came out with a flurry of kind of research behind them right so you had that big four percent play none of the none of the the daily super trainers, or whatever, I'm now Nick and Tom's. <laughs> the daily super, none of those have, have have that have any of that kind of evidence behind them yet, which is interesting because you no. just sort of have to. Accept. And, and, and they don't. And I, I think we'll all agree that they don't perform like that. That's the thing. I think I, that's the what, one where I really don't like about them, and some of them is that they're selling the idea of a super shoe to people who don't use traditional super shoes uh, either because they just don't find them approachable or they're too unstable. But they're, they're not delivering in the same way as super shoes for me like you you know you, are, you aren't getting the 
four percent, whatever it was at the start. You know, the efficiencies from some of them. That I think they are just quite nice training shoes. That's that's it's all they are. And yeah. if you're selling the idea that they've got a carbon plate in them, so they're going to do those same things, it's not always the case. Well, you, you look at you look at the Hocker Mac Five. The, hmm. the Hocker Mac Five. Everybody, we all love that shoe. Um, co- people commenting on it saying they just need to put a plate in it, and it will be hmm. the best shoe in the world ever. You create the Hocker Mac X. It's not the Hocker Mac Five. It's a completely different shoe isn't it the way that's designed but for the general consumer that looks like a superior version of the fantastic hocker mac 5 which yeah. which is not it's 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 using the some technology to make it sound like it's a superior version um, and that's the risky bit because people are spending a lot of money although the, the mac x isn't the most expensive of them maybe they yeah. no yeah i mean i was sucking in by that i thought the mac x was gonna be the best shoe of all time <laughs> you know um and i like it but it's like you say i don't like it more than the mac 5 necessarily and that's just a I know it just shows what you can do with a couple of normal layers of foam. But um, yeah, I, I I came into this last couple of months really excited. I was so looking forward to all of these shoes. I thought they're all going to be my favorite shoes. I love the endorphin speed so much. I really like the magic speed. Um, and there's been a couple that I have loved, like uh, the Boston 12 is a fantastic shoe. And, you know, and it's the cheapest one of all of these, but it does what it says it, it, on the tin. You know, It does what it says it's going to do. Super Blast, I think, is a generally... Uh, novel and exciting experience to use although whether it is a super trainer because it hasn't got a plate who knows but overall i've been left a little bit underwhelmed actually by this Mm. the new batch and there's a lot of me thinking oh maybe you know this is this is actually not a thing and i've been overexcited and you know i like to get excited so it's a bit of a shame (laughs) all right let's finish off then with a final question give us get two picks each Give us two examples, good examples of super trainers that you rate. Kieran. Well, go. you know what I'm going to say straight. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, the, yeah. speed, I, the Speed 3, you know, it's one of the one of the early ones, one of the originals. I think it, it's got brilliant versatility. It's lovely and lightweight, but it's balanced in terms of the comfort and cushioning. It's got pop. You can run easy in it. That's magic. I'm actually, I quite, I actually quite like the Mac X. I wish they called it something different so that it does it may not have drawn the mm, same I agree. the comparisons that it gets with the Mac 5 because I actually really enjoy running in it. I, I think it's quite a nice kind of racy shoe. prefer it for uh, the faster end rather than the easier end, but I'm really sort of happy to clip along in that shoe. And I, I very much enjoyed it. It was one that I'd sort of happy to slot into a, a rotation. But th- those would be kind of my two. As, there's, there's a few that I haven't tested as well. I haven't tested the Boston 12 and I haven't tested the Asics either. So, um, yeah, those would be my picks. Mm. I think I know what Nick's going to pick. <laughs> well, I for me, a super trainer. Me, it's got to go quick and it's got to be versatile. That's what I think it is. That you know, it's a shoe that, and the, the endorphin speed is still you know, the shoe that does that the best. Like I, I really clearly remember you know using the first version for a five k all out race in the morning one day, and then taking it out for a, an hour easy recovery run in the afternoon. It's just the shoes that I think can do that are quite you know small. And so endorphin speed three is still my top pick. I really do like. I'm talk more than two shoes because I'm going to be annoying now. But yeah, I really like the Boston 12 in that category. But I, I, I have been pretty blown away by the Super Blast. I've really enjoyed using it just for just for so many different kinds of runs. And it's a shoe that uh, is expensive, is a bit silly. <laughs> it's, 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 it feels like faintly ridiculous at times, but I love using it. And that is probably the other big ingredient of a Super Trainer. You've got to love using it. That's what it's trying to make it do. It's trying to give you a semi-magical feel to a daily run. And there are very few shoes that do that. And the Super Blast is kind of one of them. How about you, Tom? Well, I'm going to have to go for the endorphin speed because it is it is the, it is the best of them. I think I think it's, it's yeah. it, it still is. It's like the the vapor fly of that uh, super trainer world where it's just hold it held its own for so long with so many different brands trying to come up with their own version of it, and it's it's still the best. Super Blast I would have as well, um, but I think I think you are saying that Super Blast may not be a super trainer. For that price, it's hard to say. You, you, <laughs> yeah. you better expect it's a super trainer. But I think I think that's the thing as well. It's like. It's the same with ratios and stuff. Carbon plate doesn't necessarily. It's not the the, the you know the thing that makes the difference. It's the foams, um, yeah. And the, the super blast, it's it's all in that foam. It and to be honest, the super blast does feel like it's got a plate in. I'm surprised that it didn't have a plate in the first time I, I, I ran with it. Um, it's got a really nice dual density midsole. Yeah. It is very much to me like a souped up peg turbo almost from the past, where you've got that bouncier top layer over a firmer bottom layer. But yeah. the only other one I want to flag up, we are going to have a roundup soon and talk about these all in more detail. But I think if you're looking at it as a different brief, whereas these plated shoes are really 
cheaper alternatives to full racing shoes the only one the one that fits the bill the best for me on that front is probably actually the magic speed 3 which isn't actually that versatile i think it is a very racy very racy shoe indeed and that is quite interesting that is one other benefit of these i suppose we didn't talk about so much is like if you want to go and get a very very good racing shoe but don't want to spend 220 pounds the uh, magic speed 3 is 160 pounds wherever it is and actually at the parker and i did it at the weekend produced very similar kind of times and performance to carbon shoes and actually the people all around me at the front of that race were all in things like the magic speed the endorphin speed and it kind of becomes your like second tier racing shoe if you have a carbon shoe or even just your racing shoe if you don't want to spend huge money nice all right i think that covers us for super trainers yeah big roundup coming next month when i'm back from wales we're going to talk about them in detail moan and praise and have a good time can't wait and then we'll all pick the Endorphin Speed 3 at the end. <laughs> nice. That's it from us. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, click that little bell, and check the channel out for all the other videos we've got. Also, if you want to listen to this as part of the podcast, just go into the caption below and click on the link, and you can find it on the podcast provider of your choice. And don't forget to use your Seiski 15% code, TRT15. Catch you next time.